Well, good morning, everybody. Two things I would ask. One, when we got about three, four minutes to go, tip me off. Somebody let me know. And secondly, when you have questions, either hit the chat button or raise your hand and wave and out and get my attention. So you got two ways of getting my attention, right? Chat button or just waving your arm. All right. Perfect. So here we go by quick introduction. My name is Fred Friedman. I've been a uh, lawyer here in town since the day after Christmas, 1972. I've been a uh, professor at UMD since uh, 1975. Uh, I was raised in Chicago, uh, along with my brother, my mom and dad. And my dad had a, uh, my opinion, a heroic job. My father was after the war. My father went to uh, law school and graduate school in the GI Bill. And after serving overseas for four and a half years of combat in Europe, and uh, he went to work for the United States Department of Labor as a labor lawyer. And his job was to travel the Midwest, prosecuting farmers who refused to pay minimum wage to migrant workers and prosecuting farmers who required migrant workers' children to pick crops as opposed to going to school. So whatever I got, I came by it uh, honestly. Moved to Duluth in uh, March of uh, 1964, just a couple of months after the president was shot, a couple of weeks after the Beatles came. Went to Denfeld for a month or two and then my senior year, then the UMD undergrad and graduate school and law school at the U of M, was fortunate enough not to get drafted. So I've spent my professional career in criminal justice I was for almost 40 years, I was the chief public defender in uh, Northeastern Minnesota. I'm the longest serving chief public defender in Minnesota history. Retired six years ago. I continue to teach at UMD, been doing that since 1975. I still do a fair amount of consulting work around the country. I coach up or mentor younger defenders and do some teaching around the country. But I love Duluth, Duluth has been very kind I married a Duluth girl from three generations, and, um, and I only have good things to say about it. So we're going to talk today about uh, criminal justice. And uh, I'll stay, talk about this. this. is a very popular topic. The indication of showing you how popular it is is that every year there's over a dozen television shows about criminal law and criminal justice. And there's at most maybe one show a year about civil law, even though on a bar exam, one out of 16 questions is about criminal law. And the vast, 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 vast majority of lawyers have zero experience in criminal law. But it does appeal to the masses. It's easy to create arguments both ways. It's dramatic and it's interesting. So why is that? Well, it's true for a couple of reasons. One, stories about crime and criminal justice are interesting. It makes for good television. It makes for good novels. It's just, it's just interesting. And there's always, secondly, there's always various uh, parts of the stories or various versions of what happened. And next, and this is a huge motivating factor, is the concept of fear. Everybody is operator is emotionally controlled by fear. You're afraid of this, you're afraid of that, you're afraid of something that happened to you happened again, and you're afraid of something that never happened to you and never will happen to you, but it happened to somebody else. Just like we're afraid of bad health, right? We're afraid of losing our jobs, afraid of someone we love leaving us. Fear is a big, big factor, especially in criminal justice. The problem with criminal justice is that all it's very interesting and it's about criminal law and criminal procedure. There's not nearly enough justice in criminal justice. So here are the concepts that we just have not been able to get right in the 230 years since mostly Madison and somewhat Hamilton wrote the constitution. And here we go. Here are the things we cannot seem to get right despite the best efforts of some and because of the efforts of many others. Discriminatory sentencing, who gets what? Discriminatory pretrial release, who's sitting at home while waiting for trial 
and who's sitting in jail in a cage while waiting for trial. Inadequate public defender funding. Public defenders, in case you don't know, somebody want to guess? Just give me a guess. Of everybody that's charged with crime and goes to court, everybody that's charged with crime and going to court, I'm not talking about speeding tickets, friends. Of everybody that's charged with crime and goes to court, what percentage hire a lawyer and what percentage are represented by the public defender? So if somebody raise their hand and just guess. Just guess. So what do we got here? Go ahead, Jim, what do you have? Can't hear you, you're on mute. 5% uh, get a lawyer. Okay, Charles? I was gonna say 10. Yeah, you're dead on, dead on. 91% have public defenders, only 9% higher. So when you read on TV about uh, Kobe Bryant or Michael Jackson or the movies about Klaus von Buell or whatever, you all understand you're talking about 9% of America, right? 91% are represented by somebody like me. Now, newspapers are, are wholly responsible for making up an expression. They just made up an expression in the 1930s. And here's the expression, court appointed lawyer. That happens in maybe four states. Judges don't appoint lawyers. Judges just only decide whether you're poor, whether you're indigent, and then somebody that looks like me assigns the case out. You understand what I'm saying? So, and that of course creates inadequate funding. And I'll go back to all these. Fourth, the school to prison to prison pipeline. Poor schools means juvenile jail, means adult jail, means adult prison. Next, America's inability to agree with each other who should go to prison as opposed to who should go to a local jail as opposed to who should just be on probation. We don't agree. Next, <clears throat> how do we attract the correct, the right, the righteous applicants to go into law enforcement? What do we do to attract the right people? Everybody knows, even fools know, we got wonderful people in law enforcement and we have terrible people in law enforcement. Next, what do we do about the huge, enormous lobbying effort in every legislature and every Congress to build more prisons, whether they're wanted or not? So let's start by talking about this, about crime history, and then we'll go into criminal justice. Crime has always been a part of sociology, always been a part of the community, always been a part of life. It's referred to in ancient histories. It's referred to in Mesopotamia. It's referred to in China. It's referred to in Egyptian writings, Greek, Roman. You all know that, right? So we've always had crime. It's also referred to often in scripture, you know, both Bible and, uh, and what many of you call the New Testament. So it's always, it's always been with us. If I could turn to America, just the last four or 500 years, crime has always been part of America. As D.H. Lawrence wrote, and as James Fenimore Cooper also wrote the same quote, and here it is, men murdered themselves into this democracy. Men murdered themselves into this democracy. So what did Lawrence and Cooper mean when they say that? Well, here's what it is, right? despite hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of carefully thought out, carefully authored, real property law. You don't all know about real property. It's when you buy and sell a house, right? And you pay a bunch of money for a lawyer. You farmers, who owns how many hectares? After these fights, centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries of the British working on property law, people came here from Spain and Portugal, from England, from Scandinavia, from Germany, from all kinds of places. And the first thing they did right off the bat was ignore a thousand years of property law and just take lands from Indians, take lands from native folks who they weren't from here, but they had been here 15,000 years since they walked across the Bering Sea, which uh, was ice, right? You know that and populated the Americas. So he had all this history of property law and applied it only to white folks. So the next, 
So we not only cheated or robbed, stole from native lands, we moved east to west in America, manifest destiny by continuing to take lands from native folks as we moved east to west to west to west and took it all. Next, in 1619, a real smart guy named John Rolfe figured out that two agricultural products would grow in the semi-tropics from Southern Virginia on south. And those products were called tobacco and cotton. But Rolf was so smart enough, he knew that the only way you can make a living growing on tobacco and cotton is if you did not have to pay wages. So while the American North and the American Midwest had a history of wages, poor as they were, they had a history of wages. In the South, they figured out how to do this without paying any wages. And that's why bringing in slaves from West Africa, right? And that's what acts exactly happened. And we had a triangle where slaves would go to the Caribbean then come here. We would send money to England. England would pay for the ships. Not only England, but Portugal and Belgium too would pay for the ships that sent down to West Africa to pick up slaves. So America was founded, frankly, by stealing from the Indians, land from the Indians, and from uh, poor negotiations, and by free labor in the American South. Thus, our stains remain, our blemishes remain of how we founded the country and what happened. So the idea that you do not have to treat people equally or fairly is embedded in our, uh, in our country, in our civilization. The Declaration of Independence even mentions, though people don't like to repeat it, that we have to do something to control and rein in the savages. It's right in the Declaration of Independence. As Casey Stengel said, look it up. So from, from having crime, so we, you know, when we say about crime, and you all talk about crime, rarely do you mean crime. When you say crime or you hear the expression crime, you usually mean violence or violent crime. And that's what you're afraid of. You're afraid of you or your child or your grandchild having your purse stolen or hitting or hit over the head or attacked or whatever, right? Most crime, of course, is not about violence. It's about property stuff, okay? But nobody cares to talk about white collar crime. Nobody cares to talk about monopolies, right? Nobody cares to talk about how you can be president of the United States and siphon all the money to your hotels and your buildings and all that. So we're not talking about, mostly when people say crime, that they really mean is violence. So we had to figure out a way in America to keep controlling, let people get money, which capitalism, I guess you'd call it. But the only way we can do that is by we got to steal land in certain parts of the country. We got to get people to work for free, which means slavery. So what we've done in America when we first started and we had a constitution, and we had to figure out how to make it appeal to be fair, but at the same time, it had to be fair to get the growing middle class and the working class to support it. But at the same time, we still had to be in a situation where we could keep the downtrodden downtrodden. So that means we started this right from the get-go. When we said you have the right to vote, we didn't mean you had the right to vote. We said white land owners had the right to vote. And they had to expand that to all white folks, whether they own land or not. Then they had to expand it to other people. Then we had a civil war and fought about the 13th amendment. Then we had a suffragette movement, which is heroic as it was, closed out, ignored, and screwed over black women. And that's just true. So in the constitutional amendment was passed in 1919, giving women the right to vote. It didn't protect women of color in the American South, as you all know. So over and over again, we tried to reduce, we tried to narrow it, narrow it, narrow it, all this stuff. But, and then when we would expand it, it was always done grudgingly so. Um, the most important thing since the constitution, as you all know, when the constitution set up the government, and what rights the government has and what rights the people have, 
what we call the first 10 amendments or the Bill of Rights. And you know, we add an amendment rarely, only 17 times in history. Far and away, the most important of those amendments were the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment, which outlawed slavery, gave Blacks the right to vote and created the concept of equal protection. And the only other amendment that comes close, of course, would be the 19th Amendment, which gives women the right to vote right after World War I. So despite all that, many African-Americans did not get the vote until the 1970s and 1980s. We had horrible things by saying, no, we're not going to vote, or no, we don't have to listen to constitutional amendment. Everybody in this room is old enough to remember Governor Wallace of Alabama standing on the steps of the Capitol and saying, segregation now, segregation forever. And to our shame, we were foolish and stupid enough to let Wallace come and speak at the deck in 1968 when we had a three-way election with Nixon, Humphrey, and Wallace. And every one of you Duluthians knows somebody that was at that speech. Just like every person in this room has a grandfather or a grandfather's friend who was on 2nd Avenue East and 1st Street on June 15, 1920, when we lynched three African-American circus workers who had nothing to do with nothing, all right? And always remember, I love Duluth. But the St. Louis County Historical Society deleted, erased, trashed, and threw out all references to that lynching. So that's a perfect example of people being charged with rape. No evidence be damned. Judges said don't do it. Prosecutors said don't do it. All kinds of people said don't do it. But we still did it. So the idea is how can we talk criminal justice? How can we talk due process? How can we talk equal protection? but not mean it. You understand what I'm saying? And the proof is in the pudding. Whether it's sentencing law, whether it's capital punishment, whether it's how you get in or out of jail, too many things are decided by who you are or who you know or what color your skin is or how much money you have. So let's go, let's uh, think about this. All right, let's think about this. Let's go back to discriminatory sentencing. The great thing about sentencing, it's real easy to research who got what, how, who got how long for what crime. So we know how many people were, went to jail for domestic assault or selling drugs or cabin burglary in whatever county, in whatever state, in whatever year, and from whatever judge, right? This is, there's not, not many things easier to research. And it's just the, tr the truth that the poor go to jail more often, the poor go to jail longer, and people of color go to jail even more often and even longer. Now, this isn't because of certain attitudes. This is in spite of so many people trying to get it right. Lots of people try to get it right. But laws tend to be made by the legislatures. Most criminal law is state and local, not federal. And people get elected, whether it's the United States Congress or by its legislatures, people get elected by money, which is the true disgrace of the 2010 United States Supreme Court case of Citizens United, which says corporations can spend whatever amount of money they can on whatever other candidate. And every year, including just two months ago, a month ago, I'm sorry, the more money you make, the more likely you are to get elected. This past election, 94% of candidates, 94% of winners had more money than their opponents. So why does that matter? Because certain interests want it to stay the way it is. Uh, we talk about upward mobility, but some people don't want it. We talk about making more money, but there's definitely forces that want wages to stay low. There's definitely, we had an entire campaign this past year, past year, about let's discourage people from voting, or let's not count votes, or let's make up things about who could vote and who could not vote. So here's an example. In many states, once you're convicted of a felony, you can never vote again. Some states, you get to vote again when you're done with your time. But many states, you can't vote again. Why not? Why shouldn't everybody have a right to vote, no matter what you did? 
whether you, I understand some people have to go to prison. I understand some people have to pay a price, but why should that cost them to write the vote? And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, we've all committed crimes. There's a famous author from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, spent most of her time working here in uh, Minnesota. Her name is Emily Baxter, and she has written a bestseller called We Are All Criminals. And here's what it's about. It's about how all of us have committed crime. We haven't all committed violent crime, but we've all committed crime. It's just nobody knows about it, or nobody cares, or it's a minor offense or whatever. And what Emily did is go around America and interview all kinds of very accomplished celebrity people who've done wonderful things in their lives. And she says, now statute of limitations is long since run. Tell me something you did that nobody ever found out about. And she has all these tremendous stories of people did this or did that, and nobody ever heard about it. And if they had heard about it, they wouldn't be a doctor. They wouldn't be a lawyer. They wouldn't be a teacher, whatever. You understand what I'm saying, right? Now, the other thing that's really important about sentencing, that this is the biggest change in our lives. And when I say our, I'm going to return, refer to baby boomers. Here's the single biggest change in our life, which has affected all our lives. And frankly, it's all about technology. And here's what I mean. So when you were 16 years old or 19 years old, or nine years old, I don't care, and you walked into Target or Woolworths or Five and Dime or Kresge's or whatever, and you shoplifted some lip smacker or a razor or some baseball cards or whatever, right? And if they caught you, maybe a policeman would yell at you, maybe you'd go to court and the judge would yell at you and say, go shovel elephant dung at the zoo, or shovel snow at the old folks home or whatever, and that was the end of it. Perhaps, perhaps, there's a three by five card, which right there said the name. So Rod, I'm looking at you, and it says Rod Forseth, parking lot fight, Denfeld, right? Fine of $100, six months probation, end of it. That was the end of it. So when Rod just then he goes to Montana or he goes to South Carolina or he goes to Kenosha and gets a job, nobody knows about this. There's no way to track this. There was no way. You understand? For 200 years, there was no way. Now, everybody knows about this, right? Because of that damn thing that I'm talking through right now called a computer. All these things follow you all around. So never, never, never tell anybody that when you're an adult, your juvenile crime record goes away. That is made up. Y'all got that? That is completely made up. It's there forever. So that means now that when you get in trouble, that record follows you wherever you are. Why is that important? Because some juveniles take the attitude, what's the sense? What's the purpose? Why try to do this? Why to do that? I already messed up. My life is over. So discriminatory sentencing is a big thing. People try to do it right. We try to get it fair. We have sentencing guidelines. We try to be sensitive. Some people, but not all, not all. Some people are just in the business of discrimination. Also, another thing about sentencing, people don't agree on, on, uh, on these things. They don't agree on who should lose their liberty and who should not. Next, I want to talk about discriminatory pretrial release. This is a concept ever since the Magna Carta in 1215. And that is a concept when you are charged with a crime, the people, what I'll call a uh, ruling class, have said, well, let's get a good idea. We can't possibly hold people in jail forever. There aren't enough jails. There aren't enough guards. So let's figure out a way how we can all make money. King, you can make money. Judge, you can make money. Merchant, you can make money. Uh, we'll all make money. And we'll let you out of jail if you post bail. That means if you show up, you get your money back. And if you don't show up, you lose your bail money and the cops come and find you anyhow. And it, literally, we've had 800 years of this. No exaggeration. The trouble is, that means who's in jail awaiting trial? 
not the guilty, the poor. You get it? Because every person I'm looking at right now, if your grandchild or your child was in jail, you could afford pre-trial, pre-trial, you could afford to bail them out, right? And many of America has no way of doing that. Making it worse, we invented the despicable concept called bail bonds, right? So if your grandchild is in jail, it's something really serious. I'll just make up a crime, armed robbery. And they set bail at $20,000. And you don't want to withdraw $20,000 from your IRA or put a second mortgage on your house or whatever. We invented an invention in America and created something where you can buy a bond. That means you go to somebody that advertises on billboards up by the jail and up by the airport, and you buy $20,000. That means you give a bondsman 10% of this, you get a second signer, you pledge your house or your life or whatever, and they put up the $20,000, right? Which means once again, the upper class and the middle class get out and the poor sit in jail. Now jail serves two purposes. That's where people sit for that's where people sit for lower crimes, lower crimes doing a couple of months. And the other reason that jail serves is uh, people that can't make bail. Most of the people in jail in America are innocent. You understand what I mean by innocent? What I mean is most of the people there are presumed innocent because you're innocent until proven guilty. You got it? Sort of waiting jail. The other purpose jail serves is a lot of street people that have no place to live, are freezing, commit minor crimes that they would never go to prison for, and we hold them in jail. Here's a shocking fact. The number one and number two psychiatric hospitals in the United States are as follows. The Los Angeles County Jail and the Cook County, Illinois County Jail. Think what I just said. Because we've turned our jailers into psychiatric nurses. So discriminatory pretrial release is a big thing. Here's a radical thought. How about if you're charged with a crime and the crime is violent, just hold you and get a person to trial as soon as possible. If the crime is not violent, how about let them go and just say, come back to court. Otherwise, all we're doing is giving the bail bondsman the keys to the jail. Bail bondsmen should not have keys to the jail. Judges should have keys to jail, all right? Next, a huge problem, I talked about this, a huge problem in the United States is 91% of people they're charged with crime or represented by somebody like me. In some areas, the pay is fair. Minnesota has an excellent public defender system. So does Colorado, so does New Hampshire, so does uh, Vermont. Uh, some counties have excellent systems. Other places they're fair, other places they're just terrible, all right? I wanna give Nevada as an example. Some counties in Nevada pay their public defenders, same thing they pay the prosecutors, $120,000 a year. Other counties in Nevada for the same amount of work pay their public defenders $20,000 a year. 120 versus 20, same amount of cases, same amount of work, depending where you're at. So, and of course, legislators don't wanna pay a lot of money because who wants to represent people, who wants to pay money the people that represent the poor. Who wants to do that? So when somebody says, I don't want to give them money. So Charles, I want to say this to your friend whose name began with an H. I think you said Huckabee. We talked about the three C's, right? So tell your guy, Mr. Huckabee, this. 192 references in scripture. 192 to advocate for the poor. 192 times. So do you want to advocate for the poor? Do you mean it? Or is it just something you say for 12, 14 minutes on a Sunday morning? All right, while well, the plate's going back and forth, up and down the aisles. So my point is, if the PDs are going to represent just about everybody, pay them a decent wage. Now, the other thing you have to remember, and I'm really worried, baby boomers, I try to say this every speech I can. Here's another huge difference in your act. Remember I talked about computers make a huge difference? 
here's another huge difference. Probably the most foolish thing you could say is as follows. Work your way through college. I did. Do you have any idea how stupid that sounds to a 17-year-old? You have any idea, right? I went to UMD and law school seven years at the University of Minnesota. I never had a year that I paid $300. Never. Never. Either a scholarship or it was dead free. All right? Now a semester at the University of Minnesota is $14,000. You can walk into the bookstore right now and buy books for the medical school that are over $300. Think about that. All right? So the cost of education has gone up many, 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 many more times than the cost of living. All right? They've put a lot of money where legislatures used to pay for all this. Now we have, uh, now frankly, we have people paying for that, which means what do they do? Just like what do they do for bail? They go and borrow money from your local bank or whatever, and then they're 20 and 25 years are paying off their school loans. So all, I know that's all over Duluth. So that means it's all over everywhere. We have lawyers and judges paying off on their school loans. They're in their 40s while their children are in colleges. So if lawyers and lawyers and judges are paying off school loans, what do you think that lawyer on the street is paying off? Right? Okay. Got it? You know, I have a daughter-in-law who walked out of veterinary school owing a quarter of a million dollars. These public schools. I'm not talking about private schools. Right? I'm talking about land-grant public schools. So we've lost complete control of all this, uh, uh, which, which means it's unfair to everybody. Next, I want to talk about this. People of high character, you, me, all of us, we don't agree with each other on who should go to prison. And that's fine, but it's important because we put that important decision in the hands of judges. And judges, men and women, you know, I mean, they're trying to do the right thing. And I'll be honest with you, some of the finest people I've let, met in my life are judges. Some of the worst, most terrible people I've met in my life are judges, okay? And it's just the way, so people disagree. For example, for example, it's easy to say that if you shoplift from Target, you should not go to prison. It's easy to say that if you murder or rape somebody, you should go to prison. So let's get away from those crazy extremes and let's talk about all these cases in the middle. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's talk about all that. For example, if somebody burgles your cabin, breaks into your cabin, should they go to prison? Probably not. What if they do it five or six or seven times? They never hurt anybody. They never injure anybody. They never hit anybody over the head, but they keep doing it. Or how about somebody that constantly graffitis a public building? Should they go? What if they do it all the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So people naturally don't agree on those things. Got, got what I'm saying, right? How about the repeat drunk driver? How about the repeat drunk driver that hurts somebody or kills a passenger? And what happens if the passenger's parents say, don't send my son's best friend to prison? He didn't mean it. Should judges take that seriously or not? So these things get very, very, very complicated. So it's easy to say violent people should go to prison. I think that's the purpose of prison. But property people, not everybody agrees. So I'll make it as blunt as I can, okay? So, and this is all real life stuff. I'm not making any of this up. So let's say that two kids, same age, same grade in high school, break into somebody's house in the middle of the day. And let's say they both have the same record or the same lack of criminal record. You got it? They're equally situated. You with me? Right? And one of these kids comes from a two-parent family and all four grandparents are alive and his family's involved in everything. They're in Rotary. They're in Kiwanis. They write checks to the United Way. They write checks to the, this foundation and that foundation. They go to church. They do it all. They're over it. They contribute. They're active. They're involved. Not this kid. This kid's parents or grandparents. You understand what I'm saying? 
they know everybody. They know every police, chief of police, sheriff, judge. They know Fred. They know everybody. They know you. And let's say the co-defendant who did the same thing, break into somebody's house in the middle of the day, right? No father, never met his father, has no idea who his father is, mother's impoverished, and literally makes a living at night scrubbing the toilets in the kitchen at Wendy's or Burger King or a nursing home on her knees, right? Do any of you think that those two kids are going to get the same sentence? Do any of you really think they're going to be treated the same in the United States of America? You understand what I'm saying? You see my point, right? Of course, money matters. And of course, who you knows matters even more. Most people get their first real job because their parents or their uncle or somebody knew somebody. And then they prove or fail to prove their worth. All right. So what I'm telling you is the connection between criminal justice and poverty is immense. It's just the way it is, all right? And the poor you are, the less chances you have, you don't get your choice of lawyer, which sometimes is a good thing, and you tend to be in jail, and you don't have people looking out for you. It's, it's just the way it is. If the case requires expert witnesses, like a DNA person or whatever, there's no money for that. If the case requires investigation, sometimes there's money for that, and sometimes there's not. And I'm talking to you all in Minnesota. I'm talking to you all in a top five state in terms of justice and education and fairness. You understand what I'm saying? We're not giving this speech in Arkansas, okay? So, but the relationship between poverty and criminal justice is very, very, it's very, very too much, too tight. And that's the way people want it. So those are some of the things about criminal justice that I wanted to visit about that I felt were very important. That's not to mean there's not a heck of a lot of people trying to do right and try to improve things. I'm one of gazillions of people that, uh, try to reduce the advantage that the wealthy have over the poor. But it's an, it's an, every, it's an everyday battle. It's, it's, it's just the way it is. I talk to lawyers and people all over the country every day that tell horror stories about this happening and that happening. Now, another thing I wanna mention about before I get done talking and take your questions is as follows. I mentioned that I teach at UMD. I teach three courses every fall. I always teach a course, sometimes two courses on criminal justice. There was, when I started teaching, you could become a policeman if you just got out of high school. The pay was horrible, just like the pay to work in prisons was horrible. And they would attract D and C students that couldn't get anything else. But they appealed to the type of people that got to wear a badge, got to wear a uniform, got to wear a gun. Then America realized we got a professionalized law enforcement and they encourage college degrees and go into college and they wanted people with a more humanistic approach and it worked and as the pay went up more and more people said i want to do this and we attracted also people of higher character who wanted to make a difference literally literally wanted to protect and serve right as opposed to people that friday night wanted to get into wrestling matches got it so it got better, 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 better some places. And of course, the more money, the higher the salaries were, the better the pension was, the better the health coverage was, the more people you would attract to do that work, which meant rural America got left behind like they do in a lot of things. And wealthy suburbs got to hire whoever they wanted to hire. And major cities got to decide what they wanted to do. What kind of police did they want, right? So here are the magic words in law enforcement world. Here's the magic question to ask your chief of police or your sheriff, chief, sheriff. Do you want warriors or do you want guardians? Warriors mean people that want to fight and wrestle, do this around, do this, take their gun out of the holster, get the practice shooting, or do you want guardians that are protecting people's rights, right? 
and trying to figure out safe ways to do this. So now in the last two years, we've gone back. I used to get half my class wanted to be cops. Now in my class, I have 23 people in there, a class called law, 33 people in there, class of law and society. I have three people that want to be cops, three. And they're gonna have college degrees. And here's why they don't want to do it. One, too much fighting. Two, too great a chance of getting COVID, right? Got it? Three, just too dangerous. And four, uh, there's people that are in law enforcement I don't want to care to be with. Now, I've worked with all kinds of people in law enforcement that are just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. But 10%, 5% needed to do something else, okay? And please fall into the trap of figuring out what they got to do about uh, defending people that mess up, all right? You got to be from another planet. If you think that Minneapolis policeman that choked, you know, Mr. Taylor was in the right. Yet, you got police unions going to his defense. You see what I'm saying? Now, here's something heavy to think about. This is really heavy to think about. I'm a big as a pro-union person as there is. There is, but consider this. Is it too difficult in America to fire public employees? Of course there's police that should not be doing their job being police. Of course there's some teachers that should be doing some teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including lawyers, including judges. But getting rid of the people that should not be doing this is just about impossible under American law. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. And Chief Tuscan and Sheriff Littman will stand right beside me and say the same thing. The same thing. All right, so it's 5 to 11. I want to leave lots of times for questions and comments. Here we go. Everybody knows Fred rules. Ask everything you want, anything you want about anything. No speeches. It's question time. No long speeches. Right? And I'm seeing those nods and those thumbs up, right? No long speeches, but please ask questions. Who cares to say something? You can, I got chats in here. And why, hey, Kay, I'm going to ask you while I look in chat. You're up, Kay. Go ahead. No, you're on mute. You're muted. You're muted. I'm, I'm looking for change to come within your system. Why can't that happen? Why can't you guys figure out how to make it better? We can figure out how to make it better. There are certain things we can't do. I'm not in the legislature. I'm not in Congress, right? I can't say it's one thing to say more money for uh, defenders. That doesn't think, you know, happen. Lots of people think there should not be any bail bondsmen, but not enough. We don't have the power. We don't have the juice to do it because America is run by lobbyists who tell voters how to vote. Let me give you a perfect example. How many of you, just show me by hands, how many of you have heard the expression, three strikes and you're out? Three strikes and you're out means if you convict if you are convicted of three felonies, you do life in prison. We don't have that in Minnesota. South Dakota has that, California has it, a couple of other states has it. Do you know who invented the three strikes and you're out concept? Do you know where that came from? If I give you 20 guesses, you would get it wrong. It came from the concept, came from the political arm of the California Prison Workers Union because if they have three strikes and they're out, they can guarantee full prisons and more jobs. Think what I just said, All right? Think what I just said. And three strikes and you're out, stop and think how silly that is, right? Where it says three felony convictions, you're in life for prison. Well, I'll give you three felonies. Murder, rape, selling heroin, that's three felonies. Now I'm gonna give you three more felonies, you ready? Income tax evasion right? Palming off a Powerball ticket from your local gas station. You get what I'm saying, right? Or, oh, I don't know, uh, 
um, or whatever, not paying back uh, an insufficient check fund to your bank. You think somebody that those those three should go to prison for life? Are those three crimes similar to the murder rapist and the heroin dealer? You see my point? So three strikes and you're out sounds cute, but it depends what the strike is for. So to answer your question, Kay, uh, we don't have the power there. People that do what I do are there. We got a voice, but don't control the situation at all. Don't have the say. No more say than you do. That's my answer. So what do I have here? David wants to know, Fred, the poor have less access to almost everything. The lux vacations, fine food, higher ed, exciting vacations. If that is acceptable, then why should criminal justice be different? Great question. Great question. It should be different because the Constitution says you're equally protected under the law. It should be different because your friends that go to church and synagogue over the weekend say that we're going to advocate for the poor. We're supposed to be better than that. That's what I'm saying. Remember early on when Charles was talking about his friend, was talking about capitalism? Capitalism definitely works for what home you want to buy or where you want to eat dinner or the pants you wanna wear, or the jacket you wanna wear, or how fancy a set of earphones you wanna wear, right? Or the laptop you wanna buy. Capitalism has definitely worked for that. But let me share with you two areas of capitalism has not worked. And I'm not a socialist guy, but there's two areas capitalism has not worked. It has not worked in criminal justice. It shouldn't depend on how much money your lawyer costs or whether you can bail out. It shouldn't depend on whether you can pay back that $17,000 that you stole, that you embezzled from your employer, because you can pay it back, you won't go to prison. And if you don't pay it back, you will. And you know what else besides criminal justice that uh, capitalism doesn't work? Healthcare, healthcare. Because you gotta make a personal, I believe every American has to make a personal decision. You believe that healthcare is a privilege or a right? And it just hasn't worked where we pay money to the hospitals and the clinics and the physicians and all that. And, um, and you get your choice of physician. We're one of the few countries that do. It just hasn't worked. I'm going to keep calling on these till I see somebody's hand go up. Uh, Charles wants to know, we are hearing a good deal about criminal justice reform, ranging from shifting funding to community policing to decriminalizing nonviolent drug possession. What are your views and recommendations? Well, I think Congress is right in decriminalizing possession of marijuana. As far as I'm concerned, that's just, that's two bad things. As police to be doing the wrong work in terms of marijuana, it's the wrong work. And uh, that's one thing. And secondly, um, well, as I said, there's too many more things that they should be doing and it creates records for people. Record, when your record says, possession of drugs or your grandson's record says possession of drugs. That's not right. Does that mean cocaine? Does that mean heroin? Does that mean angel dust? Does that mean methamphetamine? Or does that mean weed? Right? So I think Speaker Pelosi is right about that. Community policing is a concept of getting cops out of squad cars and have them police on foot the areas where they live and where their families live. One of the huge problems in American law enforcement, this is one of the big problems of Minneapolis. 83% of the cops don't live in Minneapolis. They live in suburban, they live in the suburbs, right? So they have no investment in their community. They're not working with their community. They don't know the kids, the store owners, the neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. But that's true in Duluth. That's true in Duluth. We have 38 Duluth policemen that live in Esco. Okay, it's true in a lot of places. And I understand their argument. They don't wanna run into people that they arrest all the time, but they're part of the community and the community pays them. Um, David wants to know, can you comment on the most interesting point in Steve Levitt's book, Freakonomics? Research shows a 45% decline in the US crime rate after the 1990s, and he attributes it to Roe v. Wade. Well, crime, not counting the last year, this is a pre-Floyd, pre-Taylor, 
pre the Georgia killings statistics that I'm telling you, right? In other words, pre policemen murdering four or five people in Ohio and Georgia and Minnesota and Wisconsin and Kentucky, all right? Up until that, crime has been going down since the late 80s, early 90s. It's definitely been going down. When I say crime, I mean violent crime. It's definitely been going down, all right? Now, that's good because, frankly, it goes down because employment. When people work and when people go to school, they commit less crime. It's just the way it is, right? So that's true. Uh, Leavitt's point was that abortion or the right to abortion under Roe v. Wade meant that fewer people were born that had no access to education or housing or health care or justice. That's, that's his point. I haven't thought enough about it to know if that's true or not, but I know for a fact uh, that's his point. The real interesting thing, which nobody could figure out, I mean, sociologists argue about this forever, is as follows. Why is our violent crime rate, whether it's high or low, whether it's violent, why is our violent crime rate so much greater than the crime rate, just about everybody I'm looking here, where your parents or your grandparents or your great grandparents came from? Translation, Europe, right? Why is the violent crime rate in America greater than the violent crime rate in Europe, whether you came from Southern, Northern, Eastern, Western, or Central Europe. The obvious difference is, is that we embraced slavery, right? We have not recovered from, it's just a fact. We've embraced, we embraced slavery. And we said it was okay to uh, kill and shoot and steal from Indians. It's, it's just the way, it, it's just the truth. So the third issue why it's different here which people debate about, and there's no way of proving it one way or the other, is it's easier to get access to firearms here in America. I'm not so concerned about your access to firearms. I'm concerned about the access to firearms by folks with mental illness histories, right? And pick your school shooting. You all know what I mean. So, uh, let's see. Nope. We've been here, no land bridge. Well, I know that is a view that I've heard before. You know what I mean? And some, some Native American folks, that's a religious view. I'm sure it's a land bridge. You can, I'm real sure of that. You can argue whether uh, uh, Native folks were here from ever, ever, I don't know. Don't argue whether there was an ice, whether Bering Strait was iced over. Of course it was iced over. Next, what else? I've lost my picture here, folks. Yeah, me too. I've lost a picture. What happened? Bill, could you turn off uh, screen sharing? Can Bill you hear Guzzi. me while they're doing that? Bill Guzzi, could you close your screen share screen? Yes, we can hear. Great, because my screens went away. My pictures of y'all went away. Yeah, you're seeing Bill Guzzi's screen and I can't turn it off myself. While we're waiting, uh, Bill asks, uh, 1970 states paid for 85% of college, 2006 fell below 50. That's absolutely true. State legislatures, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, stopped pay, there we go. State legislators reduced drastically how much money they put into higher education. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. And that, uh, that is a 300% increase for there, compared there to the days when we went to college for the student to pay. And if you, if you also compare it to low wage jobs, when we were kids, our low wage jobs paid about 20 to 30% more per hour than low wage jobs do today and students are paying 300% more to go to school. You put, those two, you put those two facts together and you end up with people in debt. All true. Plus, think about this. Now we have students and their parents borrowing money to get their education on TV screens. Think about that, right? Think about that. I mean, I'm happy to do this. I don't want any of you to get sick. I don't want to get sick. But don't dare tell me that this is as good as having your teachers there in person. There's no way. 
go away. I know all kinds of high school students here in Duluth that have never met their teacher online or in person. Think what I just said. Never seen their face, ever. Ever. Mm. So, uh, what else? Um, what are some actionable steps Linda wants to know we can take to begin to change these inequities? One, I would outlaw bail bondsmen. I would just outlaw it, right? Give the money to the courts, don't have any middle person. And I would outlaw bail at all for property crimes. I think there ought to only be bail for violent crimes. Secondly, I would make sure public defenders get uh, far more money so you can get a lot more quality lawyers, not only do it, but stay in it, stay in it, okay? And, uh, the, and the purpose is that's, that's what you wanna do. You know, the wealthy have no trouble, no trouble hiring lots of lawyers for silk stocking, getting all the A students they want to work in corporate America, right? To represent the IBMs and the 3Ms of the world. I mean, I know this, you know, I never wanted to do this. My dad was a lawyer, he said, don't do this. I never wanted to do it. I had those grades and no thanks, not for me. But a lot of people wanna do it. And if you have school loans, you feel you have no chance. I can't tell you how many people I know, a generation below me, students of mine, worked in massive Chicago, New York, Washington, Boston, San Francisco, LA law firms, only to pay off their school debt. And then they left it. You understand, don't you, that the generation below us, when they sit around in the bar or in the coffee shop or in the coffee room at work, they're talking about their school, they're talking about their debt load. They're talking about their monthly debt load. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Fred, it's my job to say thank you. And on yeah. behalf of everyone and to remind everyone, David Swenson will be here in January. And before you go, uh, let's all show our appreciation for a magnificent presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Love hey, everybody, it. promise me you'll stay, stay safe, stay healthy. Wear a mask. Don't do anything goofy, all right? <laughs>